<laughs> okay, here we go. Well, welcome again to the uh, Robert Force Show, and this is the uh, American Appalachian Dulcimer, the American Dulcimer. This is the second part of our chronicles where I'm going to take you, invite you rather, on a, on a trip, and that trip is part historical, some of the events and times that shaped my life, and uh, I guess we would call it, that's what history is, in my case specifically, his story. I make no, no pretense at saying that I know how it was for everybody, but there's a quotation that sort of guided me through my life, and it's this idea that the responsibility of an artist is to say, this is where I am right now, I'm just reporting in. And sometimes when you're reporting in, uh, it's like I said yesterday, maybe you're reporting about failed love, or maybe you're reporting about, uh, uh, about discovered love. Uh, the duty of a writer or a singer-songwriter or a painter or an artist or a dancer is to, is to bring these things forward. But as I look back over 30, 35 years of doing this, one thing I want to be sure that I share um, with you fellow blog uh, watchers out there is that people don't come from just full-blown onto the stage and say, gee, look at that person. I think it's very important to show how art is developed. And so part of what I'll be doing is talking about uh, artistic techniques, particularly as they relate to the dulcimer, but I'll bring other guest artists in. Uh, but I'm also going to be looking at, uh, at some of the outtakes and, and commercial products that have been out there in the world over this last 30 years. And I'm going to start with that uh, today, talking about what's out there. Okay? I started playing the dulcimer uh, when I was 19, so we'll put the date about 1969. And in 1969, I had already uh, responded to, to I, I was in college. I started in college in 66. Uh, I was the first person to like bring the Jefferson Airplane and the Grateful Dead up to the Pacific Northwest because I was interested in what the current music scene was. And I can remember very specifically I was putting this concert on and my job at the, in those days was to pace back and forth outside and chain smoke cigarettes and hope that I made enough money to pay the band. Uh, which I didn't uh, <laughs> for the uh, Jefferson Airplane or the Starship as they later became. Uh, but they were gracious about it. And then one day the penny dropped and I said, you know, it sure looks like they're having a lot more fun up there. And everybody around me played musical instruments and they had guitars going, they had mandolins and they had banjos and people doing the pianos and you know, and this was long before people were the Irish craze where people were beating on bull runs and, and so on and so forth. Um, and I had heard the music of a man named Richard Farina. When I first went to college in 66, I had a person who sat me down, and I kind of grew up in a country western farm boy era, and I didn't really know much about, about a wide range of music. And that one evening, he played bagpipes for me. He played the pentangle. He played John Renborn. He played uh, Japanese sakawachi flute. He, he played all the, the Judy Collinses, the, the Dave Van Ronks, the, the Libba Cottons, uh, these, these people who I would come to know later on through their music and some of them personally. And in this process, I heard this one kind of music and that music appealed to me. I wasn't sure what it was. I found out later that it was the uh, music of Richard and Mimi Farina. And I looked at what they were doing, I should say, I looked at, I listened to what they were doing. And over that next year or so, I decided uh, like I say, the penny dropped when I was in backstage once and watching the people up there saying, I'd rather be up there doing that. And it wasn't because I wanted to be in the business. I mean, my, it was never my intention to go into the business. My intention was that I saw that music was a transformative tool. And this was a transformative time and I wanted to be able to use it in such a way that I could explore the world around me. So, basically, I took what I, uh, I won in a poker game one night, $18.50, and I went to an Austrian immigrant violin maker in my town by the name of Al Fisher. This is Bellingham, Washington, so that's a very tip part of the continental United States, just below Vancouver, Canada. So I went to him and I showed him an album cover of the, of the Richard Farina album, uh, their uh, celebrations for a gray day, I believe, and I said, can you make me something like this? And he said, well, I've been, I can't do my German accent, but he said, I've been doing this. And he showed me this instrument that he had, he had built, and he said, I got it out of a 1945 edition of Popular Mechanics. Popular Mechanics. I, I said, okay. 
Uh, can I buy it for $18.50? Yes, you can. Uh, and I took that instrument home and I started playing on it. And that night, three tunes. Now, they're not great tunes, but the tunes, they're there. Uh, the dulcimer teaches you itself how to play it because of its diatonic and Pythagorean nature. And we'll get into that, of course, much later in all these blogs. But tunes came out of me. The, 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 not just the songs, but this is where I am. And you, you see the things you're thinking about. And, and to me, that was an extraordinary uh, process. And I guess uh, for those of you that are aware of the dulcimer, now this was a very classic traditional dulcimer in a sense it had only eight frets. Take a look at uh, how this instrument is. This is exactly a diatonic instrument because there are no what's called extra spaces. They look fat and skinny and fat and skinny and that's because it falls do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. So the E, F, B, C cycle is sort of built into it. And, uh, but in his instrument, the traditional part was only the melody string went over the frets. The other two went into uh, just drones. And so when I learned to play, I didn't learn to play by doing what people do these days, you know, with chords. That's a D chord, and here's one that's a C chord. <laughs> Badly played. I say I'll do it this way. You got, you know, here's a D. Oh, D chord, C chord. G chord, and you know how song da na 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 da 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 da, and and you build chords. But for me, since I only had one string, everything I learned was going up and down the neck, and up and down the neck, and up and down the neck, and trying to find some way to let this drone sound make musical sense to me. And so I began playing the instrument, learning about the instrument, and I have to truthfully say that I knew nothing about the instrument. I didn't know where it come from. It could have been from Turkey. It could have been from, uh, 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 it could have been from the Fiji Islands, from Australia. I didn't know. To me, it was just a sound. It was a sound I wanted to, to learn to play. And so I did. And, and when Richard Farini was holding the dulcimer for his album, Shot, he was holding the dulcimer with his wife, and he's holding it like this basically, across his lap. And I thought, well, guitar players play that way, and banjo players play that way, and mandolin players play that way, except they go underneath. And then, so I just simply put a strap on the instrument, stood up, and began playing it that way myself. Later on, almost five years later, when I found out that the dulcimer was actually an Appalachian folk instrument, and dating back to the, to the uh, late 1800s, I found that people actually played it on their lap and played it in a flat arm extended style and even used their thumb to make the notes happen and then sometimes had a little stick that went up and down. And we'll talk about that when I talk about traditional playing uh, sometime much later on. But what I'm emphasizing right now is that my, my uh, uh, relationship with the dulcimer was not based on traditional roots. It was simply based on, wow, what a great sound. I think I'll try to learn to do something with it. And so, over the next, I would say about three or four years, several different things happened. One is I needed a place to play. Uh, luckily at that time at Western Washington University, I was the uh, recreation director. What a, what a scam. <laughs> but what it meant was they gave you money and you got to put on events for people and create things for people to do. And so I started a coffee house up there called Mama Sundays. And uh, the early, the, the first name, it was Mama Sunday's Hamburger and Hot Rod Haven. You know, it was the hippie era. You had to make things kind of dance and sparkle a little bit. And basically, it was a place where people could come and play for free. And that whole college coffee house activity that was going on in places as remote as, as, as Bellingham, in Yellow Springs in Ohio, in Berkeley, uh, in, uh, in the Haight-Ashbury, uh, the McCabe's down in, in Los Angeles, uh, all, all these different places contributed to creating a spot where literally thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people started playing music of one kind or another because they had a place where they could come and share. And boy, oh boy, uh, I have to apologize. I have to apologize. And I'll apologize on behalf of all folk musicians uh, because we were terrible. You know, the long stringy hair that you wash sometimes and you just kind of banged away at the cords and you sag with, with kind of, you know, no control. But, but the other thing about it is that I won't apologize for is that we sang with passion and we sang with conviction. And so 
from that coffee house roots up there in the very corner of the northwestern part of the United States and learning about the instrument and picking up techniques from the other players around me, the guitar players and, and, the, and the banjo players. And there were no other dulcimer players. And then one day, literally one day, a person said, hey, I see you're playing the Appalachian dulcimer. It never occurred to me to actually research the dulcimer. It's not like today, there's no internet where you could type in dulcimer, tell me everything. Uh, and so I said, Appalachian dulcimer? And they said, yeah, the Appalachian dulcimer. So, ding, the penny dropped again. And this time I did go down to the music store and say, oh, do you have anything on dulcimers? And they gave me a book on Gene Ritchie. And I'll tell you more about Gene Ritchie in our next episode. So, until then, stay tuned. This is the Robert Force Show. <laughs>